Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Anna Marie. Thank you, Shane. And thank you for participating with us as we sing and we worship. I want to invite you to open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27. I had originally intended to uh, share this message. Last Sunday is our choir uh, presented the uh, choir special last week near the cross and uh, I watched that at home and enjoyed it very much so. So thank you choir and Ryan for leading us in that. But uh, this passage is so powerful and I believe uh, its context to us today so true that it's important for us to visit this text again and uh, to look at it together. Matthew chapter 27 is where I had you turn. So that's the first gospel, first book of the New Testament. Testament, Matthew, uh, almost the end of that uh, gospel, Matthew chapter 27, as uh, we read here about the events swirling about the death of Christ. And then, of course, as we go into the next chapter, we read of his resurrection and in his ascension. Uh, but we don't want to pass over uh, all that we find here today. How will you respond to this king? You're going to find in this passage several responses being made, and that's where I want us to focus today as we look at this text together. So uh, I want you to uh, look at your place with me in the scriptures. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2, and then we're going to go down to verse 11 and read uh, a good portion of the passage from there. But if you have found your spot, you'll see it behind me as well. You can follow. Will you please stand with me this morning as I read this passage aloud, and uh, you follow along with me as we honor God's Word together. Matthew 27, starting in verse 1, the Apostle Matthew writes, When morning came... All the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate, the governor. Now go down to verse 11. Now Jesus stood before the governor. And the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with this Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. You pray with me. Lord, thank you for the greatest story ever told of your son Jesus, who again, as we've read today, we find in the throes of accusations and false testimonies, Lord, so many words being spoken about Jesus and against Jesus, and yet, like a lamb led to the slaughter, Lord, you were silent because you became sin for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you died for us and that you rose again. And you, Lord, are not on the cross anymore, but you reign 
forevermore. You reign on the throne. You reign in our hearts. And Jesus, one day you'll come back and all the world will behold you. So we celebrate this today. But now, just as then, you're calling us to respond. Jesus, you've done all that you were required, all that had to be done for our salvation. Now we must respond. Every day, every one of us, Jesus, will you help us to respond being led by the truth of your word, your spirit speaking even now. May you find fertile soil in our hearts that will bear fruit for eternal life. Jesus, we ask it in your name. Amen. I want to thank you for standing with me and for going through God's Word together with me again today. You know, when it comes to talking, everybody's kind of at a different place. Uh, some of you, quite frankly, we can't ever get you to shut up, all right? You're just always, always talking, right? And some of you, I, I barely hear you, hear you say anything. I mean, if I don't know you're in the room, I don't know you're in the room because uh, you're not talking. And, and sometimes we're, we're on a gambit in between uh, those two extremes. Uh, many of us, uh, I, uh, I read a story I thought was kind of humorous that uh, relates the power of speech in itself. Uh, there was a man who was driving around the backwoods of Montana. He saw a sign in front of a broken down shanty style house and it says, talking dog for sale on the sign. He knocked on the door and the owner appeared and they told him that the dog was in the backyard. This really caught the guy's attention and so the man walks in the backyard. He sees a nice looking Labrador and uh, he's just sitting there in the shade. And so he walks up to the dog, understanding the message and he just looks at the dog and he says, do you talk? Yep, the lab replied. After the man recovered from the shock of hearing the dog talk, he said, so what's your story? The lab looked up and said, well, I discovered that I could talk when I was pretty young. I wanted to help the government. So I joined the CIA. In no time at all, they had me jetting from country to country, sitting in rooms with spies and world leaders because no one figured a dog would ever be eavesdropping. I was one of their most valuable spies for eight years. But the jetting around really tired me out. I knew I wasn't getting any younger, so I decided to settle down. I signed up for a job at the airport to do some undercover security, and I, I would wander about suspicious activities and conversations, and I found out all kinds of information. I reported it to the authorities, and they gave me all kinds of medals for the things that I was able to do. Then I got married, I had a mess of puppies, and now I'm just retired. The man was absolutely astounded by this talking dog and all that he had experienced. So he goes back to the owner and he asks him, I got to know, what, what, would, what, what would you have me give you for this talking dog? And the man looked at me and said, $10. He said, $10? Amazing, only $10 for a talking dog? Why so low a price? He says, oh, that, yeah, let me tell you why. Uh, this is why it's so cheap. That dog's a liar. He's never been out of the backyard. <laughs> Listen, when it comes to, to words and to talking, a talking dog, right, would be something rather amazing. But you know, I read for many of us, talking is not that big a deal. Uh, I read recently that on any given average day, uh, a man will share about 15,000 words. That's a stretch for some of you, okay? Uh, but a woman, get this, 30,000 words. Is anybody surprised by that, all right? Uh, 30,000 words from a woman, 15,000 from a man. No, none of us should be too shocked by that. Uh, I read a story about Mrs. Bettis, <clears throat> Mr. and Mrs. Bettis, faithful members at their church. She came down with a really strong condition of laryngitis, wasn't able to speak for several days. The doctor told her husband you need to take care of her. She's not going to be able to talk. And so they worked out a system where they could communicate because she couldn't talk, which was a major problem. And so this was the system he worked out. He said this. He said, he explained her this to her. He said, I tell you what, Betty. He said, honey, um, one tap, okay, one tap on a piece of wood or one tap on my shoulder, that means yes. Two taps means no. Three taps means give me a kiss. And 147 taps means take out the garbage, all right? So uh, whatever system or way we have developed for communicating with each other, what we read about here in these gospel accounts is that there is much communication that is going on. 
There's communication from religious leaders. There's communication regarding uh, from, from the, the uh, Roman governor, Pilate. There's communication from the crowds. There's talk about Jesus. There's talk swirling around Jesus. There's talk to Jesus. But what is very incredible about this passage is that Jesus barely says a word at all. See, this is not something we're very familiar with in the gospel accounts, is it? Now, the majority of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the words of Jesus. They're about him. They're his teaching. They're his sermons. They're his words of healing, of encouragement, of rebuke, of even chastisement against sinners. There's all kinds of words that are given by and from Jesus. But in this account, on this fateful Friday, in which Jesus had been illegally tried, there are all kinds of words being said about him and to, and to him in accusation, and yet we find Jesus saying next to nothing. His words are few. He's giving no words in his own defense or in protest, though what is happening around him is an immense travesty of justice. In fact, the greatest in humankind. This all was a part of prophecy, you see. Isaiah 53, 7, you'll see behind me, tells us this. According to the death of Christ, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that's led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before it shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. This was prophesied that Jesus would respond this way. Peter also reiterated this same truth in his, in his uh, epistle. 1 Peter 2.23, you see, he says this, When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. See, the time for Jesus talking at this point in human history was over. He had shared his truth. He had taught the, 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 the wisdom of God. He had brought hope and healing from his words. He had brought his power. And now that time had passed and he is given over into the hands of evil for a time of darkness. He will speak again. He is the king. And one day, at the shout of an angel, all, all of us will know and hear him speaking verbally again. He's now speaking through his word and through his Holy Spirit. But for this stint of time, Jesus is silent. It was the time of evil. So that justice could be satisfied, the justice of God, the Lamb of God, would have to become sin for us. And so he would go to the cross and he would be silent, taking on the full brunt of God's punishment for us. But what is interesting is that in the words that are shared about Jesus and toward Jesus and around Jesus, what we find are all kinds of responses to him. And I think they give us an accurate reflection today of the same kind of responses that we still give. You see, now is the time in which we've been given to respond to Jesus. And we're all responding to him. One way or another, whether it be with many words or few, whether it be with obvious actions or not, we are responding to Jesus. And so in the, in the governor's response, and in the crowd's response, and the religious leader's response, and even in Barabbas' response, what we find is the, the responses that are given to Jesus even still today. See, his death does not allow us to remain silent. We must respond one way or another. And so I want us to walk through this passage and see four responses at least that are given. How those match up historically with the scriptures as we have them presented to us today and then find out just exactly where we are on the gambit. How are we responding to Christ? Here's the first thing that I want to show you. The response is one of accusation. Accusation. We find this in verses 1 and 2 that the religious leaders, the scribes and Pharisees, as they are labeled, this would be uh, the ruling class of the Sanhedrin, they were leveling against Jesus accusation, declaring him to be guilty. Now, to give you a, a replay again, a reminder of what has taken place, on Thursday evening, Jesus is arrested, and he is sent through a mock trial. Everything they did was absolutely illegal, according to Jewish law. Trials could not happen at night. Uh, the, the way and manner in which they did things was to push things through in a secretive and a very evil manner. 
They had brought false witnesses against Jesus. None of this would have ever held up in an actual court of law. However, in order for their decision to be final and to hold any weight whatsoever, they had to hold a trial in the daylight. And so that's exactly what takes place at the beginning of Matthew chapter 27. Yet, for this ruling council, this group of 70 men who were the leaders of the nation, the religious leaders and the civic leaders, for them to come together and make this decision, while they could accuse Jesus, while they could put him on trial, they could not put him to death. You see, that would break their own code and law. And so they would take Jesus, the prisoner, to Pilate, the Roman procurator. Only he could sentence anyone to death, for they were under Roman rule. Now the Sanhedrin, this group that Jesus would be standing before, is made up of, of a professional clergy in a community that's grounded on the Old Testament scriptures. These men are lawyers, but, but lawyers in this sense, they knew God's law. You see, they study God's law. They memorize great portions of God's law. They were to be living God's law because this is why they had been apportioned out for this responsibility and task by the people and even by God himself. You see, they were to know the law so well that at any point in time when the Messiah would finally come, they all believed the Messiah would come as promised in the Old Testament. And when the Messiah came, it would be the religious leaders who could tell everyone there he is. They would point the way. That's why they were to know the scriptures so well. The high priest served as the highest authority in the land because he would have what is a unique connection to God believed by the people. And the entire Jewish system of faith was built upon their leadership in knowing when the Messiah would finally come. And yet what is so backwards about this scene is that when Messiah finally came, the very ones who were to know who he was are the very ones who accused him and then eventually positioned him to death. You see, his greatest opposition never came from those with, with a lack of knowledge of scriptures. It came from people who knew the most, who should have been ready and prepared, and yet here we find them. How is it that men who are so revered for their religion and for their piety and faith could be so far off? How is it that these men that know the scriptures and understand the times and have been put into a position not only by people but by God himself, how is it that they weren't ready? How is it? We find an indication of exactly why this had occurred. Luke chapter 7, I'd have you turn there with me and you can see the passage behind me as well because along with others, I think this so excellently describes why the religious leaders who should have been ready weren't for Jesus. We find in Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 18, these words. The disciples of John, this is John the Baptist, reported all these things to him. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? In that hour he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits. On many who were blind he bestowed sight, and he answered them, Go and tell John what you've seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Stop right there for a second and explain what's going on. John the Baptist wants to be certain that Jesus is in fact the Messiah. He's uh, doubting what he knows to be true, which is oftentimes true of many of us in the faith. And so Jesus just points to his actions and how they line up with every prophecy about what the Messiah would be. What he is, he does. How do we know Jesus is who he says he is? Well, let's look at what he did. Let's look at what he said. Let's look at, at exactly everything Scripture says about him. And so he points all this to them. And then in verse 24, when John's messengers had gone, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. Would you go out in the wilderness to see a reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see, a man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who are dressed in splendid clothing and live in luxury are in king's courts. What then did you go out to see, a prophet? Yes, I tell you, more than a prophet. 
This is he of whom it's written, Behold, I'll send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now here it is. Here's why the religious leaders never knew who Jesus was. Here's why they rejected him. In a parenthetical note by Luke as he writes this. When all the people heard this, and the tax collectors too, they declared God just, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves, not having been baptized by them. What was the baptism of John? It was a baptism of repentance. And the Pharisees and the religious leaders in all of their piety and steeped in their own self-righteousness refused to repent. You see, the key to a relationship with God through Christ is repentance. And, and even today, those who would reject Christ don't reject Him based off of a misunderstanding of who He is. It's not primarily based off of, of thinking that, that God couldn't send His Son or, or a misunderstanding of not, not, not being able to, to understand the message of the gospel that God could forgive us through His Son. Listen, it's not because Jesus is not worth following or having, but it's rather this. They won't repent. You see, whether it be in churches or those who would never attend church, ultimately those who reject Jesus Christ do so because they refuse to turn from their sin. They cherish sin more than they cherish Christ. And so as a result, they would accuse Him and they would reject Him. Even today, even as then, this is also the case. A refusal to repent. You see, this re same reaction is given by so many, whether those, they be in the church or out, they accuse Christ rather than follow Christ. And can I just say, this is precisely why the practice of religion without the presence of a relationship is so dangerous. We can think we have all the things of God and not know Him at all. Miss Him altogether. The most religious. Listen, these, these Pharisees and scribes, we may look down on them today, but they knew more Scripture than everyone in this room put together. They followed it. They lived it. And yet they missed Messiah. They missed Him altogether. How is it possible? A crowd of men, women, and children decades ago huddled together at a train station. Dressed for a long journey and standing with their bags at their side, they spoke in low tones. Armed men in grim uniform labeled SS, the feared wing of the Nazi army, surrounded the travelers. The people shivered on the platform. They were not criminals. They were Jews, French Jews who had been hauled from their homes by the occupying soldiers and French Nazi sympathizers. The non-Jewish French watched these events unfold with increasing concern. After all, these people were neighbors. They were friends. The group included the watchmaker and his family, the, the little boy who sold newspapers, the old lady who made beautiful quilts. Now they were being relocated. Plumes of smoke could be seen ever before the train was heard. The townspeople cast a nervous eye toward the train platform as the black soot-belching locomotive ground to a halt. Armed guards herded the Jews into train cars. They went cooperatively, putting up no resistance. Concerned observers wondered why this was taking place. But they told themselves that things would be fine. There's no need to worry about friends and neighbors. They were in good hands. How could they believe that? Historically true, this is why, because printed neatly in French on the door of every boxcar was the reassuring logo, Charitable Transport Company, as they were being hauled to their death. And listen, even today, there are many who are being hauled into a Christless eternity, fooled by whatever it is that's taking them there, just as these religious leaders were in their day. Uh, Jesus shares a uh, what are harrowing words in Matthew chapter 12. And I don't think there's any one of us that have read this and, and, and probably not uh, misunderstandably connected ourselves somehow to this passage. Matthew chapter 12, 31 and 32, Jesus says this, 
Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people. But the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come. I can remember years ago reading this passage and, and really struggling for some time thinking that I had committed the unforgivable sin. Perhaps you've been there before too. Thought maybe, maybe that thing I said, maybe that thing I thought, maybe that thing I did means that I'm locked out from a relationship with God forever. Well, I want to assure you with a word of promise from Scripture. First, in the exact manner that it happened in that day, this sin's not able to be committed. You see, Jesus was physically on the scene, and he was saying that you may reject me now physically, but for those who know better, for those who have been revealed the truth, if you continue to deny and reject me, then you are cut off. You are blocked out from eternal life. It's an unforgivable sin. And so while it can't be committed in the exact same manner now as it was then, understand there is an unforgivable sin. If you exit this life without having put your trust in Jesus Christ, you cannot be forgiven. You see, the only window of opportunity for eternal life is here. It's now. It's not tomorrow or next year because those are days that we're not promised. And it's certainly not at the moment that we stand in eternity before God. Listen, that window is over at that moment. Sins aren't forgiven at that time. Now's the time, Paul says, the day of salvation is today. And so... We must understand that like those religious leaders who should have known better, there are many today still who they may not appear so, but on the inside they are accusing Christ, responding to him in this way through their unrepentance and their lack of faith. Now here's the second response we see that day as Jesus was being tried and eventually crucified. We see the response of apathy. Not just a response of accusation, but now apathy. And we see it primarily in this figure, Pontius Pilate. Uh, he's one of the most infamous men in history. Uh, not just in biblical history, but even extra-biblical history. We know really very much about him. Uh, he was the sixth Roman procurator to serve in Judea under their rule. He was not liked by the Jews because he did things that deliberately violated their law and provoked them. He was not above killing uh, many Jews. We read this even in the biblical accounts. His position was always rather precarious because of his bad relationship with Israel and his desire to please Rome. It put him in a very difficult spot oftentimes. Listen, the only reason the religious leaders would even come to him and brought Jesus to him was the fact that, that by their law, Pilate was the only one who could do anything about Jesus. And these were political charges. Specifically, Jesus was being charged with three crimes. He was being labeled as guilty of misleading the nation, forbidding the paying of taxes, and then finally claiming to be a king. These are political charges without question. And so Pilate would hear about him. So Pilate now is in a position where he needs to deal with this revolutionary. And the manner in which he deals with him will determine his continued rule and peace or rioting and unrest in the nation. Now, while Pilate obviously believed Jesus to be innocent, we read of this in these accounts, as he questions him, he discovers that there is no reason for Jesus' death and the accusations being leveled against him are false. We understand that his own conscience is telling him this. We even get a picture in this gospel account that Pilate's wife comes and tells her that, he, that, that tells him that she had a dream, and, and in this dream that, that Jesus was not to be put to death, that he was an innocent man. And yet what we find is that Pilate goes down in history as one of the most infamous examples, not of hatred for Jesus, but of a careless attitude toward Jesus. Uh, the great British statesman Edmund Burke famously said decades ago, the only way for evil to prevail is for good men to do nothing. Now, none of us 
historically or biblically speaking, could ever claim Pilate to be a good man. He was not that. However, what we see is that within his grasp and power is the ability to do something. And he refuses to do anything. And as a result of his apathy, he responds to Jesus. And it, it quite frankly provides for us what is a very common response to Jesus even today. You see, there are many people who will not reject Christ. They will not openly abuse him with their words. They claim him to be a good teacher. <clears throat> they claim him to be one that is worthy of following and emulating on some level. And yet they just won't follow him themselves. They won't reject him or deny him, and yet they won't also follow him. Yet in refusing to make a decision for Christ, they have certainly made a decision. They have certainly denied him. See, this dangerous attitude isn't just among those who are outside the walls of the church. It happens inside the church all the time. I mean, countless times we've sung songs like, I surrender all by people from lips of those who won't surrender their money to God. They won't surrender their time to God. They won't surrender their service to the church. They won't tell someone else about Jesus. They won't obey God in every matter uh, of fact in their lives. Listen, we do it all the time. We sing songs and we make proclamations and yet in our hearts and lives, we are apathetic toward following Christ. And listen, it's not because we don't care. It's because we just don't care enough. Pilate was in this position. It's not that he didn't care. He was obviously moved by a response to Jesus. He was moved by his wife wor wife's words. And yet he did not care enough. He didn't care about things of eternity enough. And so as a result, it's this apathetic response. You know, one of the most famous scenes in history is that scene of, of Pilate. Can you imagine being there? It was actually one in which he would place a bowl in front of him just like this. And as Jesus stood there, the accused, and he asked the crowd, what should we do? Pilate famously took his hands in that water and he made that statement. My hands are washed free of this man. I'll tell you for all eternity, I think we could find Pilate in a Christless hell still washing his hands, trying to remove the blood of the one for whom he is guilty. Because he wouldn't let that blood cover him. Instead, he was guilty of it. Listen, we can take on an apathetic attitude toward Christ, but to, to, to choose not to make a decision is a decision. It's a decision to deny him. And we see it even still today. Now, not only do we see accusation and apathy, but we also see aggression. Aggression. In fact, this is probably the most prominent response we see here, at least in the amount of voices that are being given. There's a large crowd of people that are gathered here this day at the, uh, at the trial of Jesus and at the accusations being leveled against him. And of all the responses that are given toward Jesus at his trial, this one probably is the most common, not only then, but even now. They called for the cruel torture and execution of a man based not upon matters of conscience, conviction, evidence, or even principle, but solely based off of the power of the crowd. The crowd is all-powerful. The mob will rule. You see, and if enough voices are being leveled all around us, we'll eventually... And without conviction, we'll eventually follow the voice of the mob because above all things, we don't want to be singled out. And so here we find so many in the same way. You see, isn't it amazing how most people in our culture, in fact, oftentimes many of us, base so many of the decisions that we make not off of fact, not off of an understanding of truth, not off of principle or convictions, but rather, what's the easiest choice according to everyone around me? Will they accept the decision that I make or would they reject it? You see, so many would reject Christ because they just don't want to be singled out in the crowd. Uh, when uh, I was serving with a football team in college, 
Oh, Alabama was playing Florida in the, the first SEC championship that was played in Atlanta. So they had moved from Birmingham at that time. And uh, as the old Georgia Dome, which is not even there anymore, and as we were playing that game, uh, my parents told me, I, I was able to get my parents' tickets and go on to the game. And, and so after the game was over, everyone was filing out of that building. And that, that Georgia Dome at the time was relatively new. It was one of the, the first games that, that, that was being played uh, at the time there. And they shared with me an event that happened that I think illustrates this point so well. Uh, they were on an escalator as they were leaving the facility in the building. You know an escalator, the moving stairs. And it was just packed. It was just so crowded and full of people. And they found themselves just people behind them, people in front of them. And all of a sudden that escalator just stopped. And so my parents, along with 100 other people standing on the escalator, stood there for minute after minute after minute and looked at each other and said, what do we do now? I guess we're stuck. <laughs> Before someone realized, we can actually walk up these steps. We can walk down these steps. Listen, the power of the crowd is powerful. See, what people around you do, which is why it's so critical, <clears throat> why I pray for my children every day, oh God, please make them wise in who they choose to spend their time with because we become the people around us. We, we make decisions based off the people around us. And we've seen this with our children. We've seen it with our own lives. Them making good or horrible decisions all based off the people they surround themselves with. Yet the time comes for all of us when we have to make the decision that regardless of what anyone else does, I will follow Christ. Jesus would explain it this way in Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide, the way is easy, that leads to destruction. Those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard, that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Listen, there are undoubtedly untold millions upon millions who rejected Jesus Christ and go into hell for eternity because that's what everybody else did. And it's not just true for those without Christ. It's true for us in Christ. Listen, sometimes we even have to stand against others who claim to know Christ by doing what we know to be right, by doing what we know to be difficult, because that is what God's Word says. <clears throat> this attitude of aggression. You know, I, <clears throat> if you can see what this is, I brought this from the house. These are becoming pretty popular these days. This is a thermometer. Right? you probably having to have your, your temperature checked in a couple of different places for different reasons and things of this nature. Think about the difference between a thermometer and a thermostat. We've got a thermostat on either side here of this building. Right? The thermometer tells you what temperature it is. The, the thermostat sets the tone. You see, according to what God's Word tells us, He didn't call us to be a thermometer. We got enough people that are telling us what the temperature is. We got enough people telling us what the problems are, how we need to fix them, what the issue is that they have. Listen, we got plenty of that going around. You know what He called us to? He called us to be a thermostat among God's people. To set the tone by our humility, by our joy, by our service, by our sacrifice. This is what Christ has called us to. And in this manner and way, we stand out against the crowd. Here's the last thing I want to show you. <clears throat> Not just this attitude of accusation, apathy, aggression, but finally acceptance. And what's so amazing is, is that we see this attitude of acceptance in a very strange circumstance. There's one final response to Jesus in this passage that's really rather obscure and comes from a very unfamiliar location. And it comes from this character, Barabbas. We know nothing in history outside of the Gospel's presentation of Barabbas. According to uh, the, the, the uh, laws that he had broken, the, uh, the punishment that he was to receive, we know that he was a violent man, had probably been violent for some time. He had caused a riot, which means he was murderous. Perhaps he had killed one, perhaps more than one. He was opposed to Roman rule. He was a murderer, a robber, a notorious nationalist. And he represents morally everything opposite to Jesus Christ. Listen, Jesus didn't deserve to die. If anyone ever did, it's Barabbas. 
He was accused. He was convicted. And yet what is so amazing about this is that this criminal deserving the punishment of death for his crimes was shown an amazing amount of mercy. Just imagine the scene with me if you would. Barabbas may or may not have ever known who Jesus was. But here's Barabbas sitting in a Roman prison on the day of his proposed death for crimes that he had committed. And all of a sudden, here comes the guards and they unlock that, 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 uh, uh, that door and they swing it wide open and Barabbas is now perhaps looking for a way of escape, looking for a way just to uh, somehow courageously face his own death now. And he's told these words, Barabbas, you're set free. Now listen, the only thing more ludicrous than the fact that Barabbas was set free by a man who was not guilty would be if Barabbas looked at him and said, no, I, I think I'll stay. I think I'll stay in the prison cell. I think I'll go ahead and die for my crimes. See, Barabbas, at least to that degree, was no fool. From all accounts in Scripture, we find that Barabbas was set free that day. Now, did he come to Christ? Did he repent of his sins and turn to faith? We do not know. That's left to us to wonder. However, this is what we do know. That day, he was set free as one who was innocent took his punishment and took his crimes. And you see, the only thing more ludicrous than the story of Barabbas is that Christ also has set us free through his mercy. And to imagine, we would look at God and say, no, I, I enjoy the sale. I think I'll stay in the prison cell. I think I'll live in my guilt, in my shame, in my unforgiveness, in my bitterness, in my brokenness. I'm enjoying that atmosphere. And yes, I'd just rather pay for my own sins. I'd rather face a Christless eternity apart from God forever. Thanks, God, but no thanks. It's ludicrous, and yet it's true. It happens every day. You see, it is acceptance. You see, initially, the life of following Jesus Christ is just this, that you take on the mercy of God. You just trust in His mercy. You trust that God sent His Son Jesus who died on the cross and rose again from the dead and that His punishment on the cross pays the penalty for your sins and in doing so, you have been set free. Listen, then God transforms your heart and changes your life. That is the gospel. That's the gospel. And yet so many would reject it. You know, there's irony in the words of Pilate that day and the crowds as they were gathered. As Pilate would accuse Jesus and would level him over to be crucified, handing him over to his accusers, what's, what's rather amazing is that the crowd made this response. They said, let his blood be on us and on our children. Horribly fateful words. But here's the reality. Unless the blood of Jesus is on you and your children, you have no part with him. It's quite ironic, isn't it? See, not his blood in the sense of accusing him and rejecting him, but rather his blood of mercy. You know, the question's oftentimes been asked, who killed Jesus? Was it the Romans who actually nailed him to the cross? Was it the Jews who, who leveled their complaint against him and falsely presented him? Was it the crowds? Was it the religious leaders? Here invariably is the answer from Scripture. It was all of us. It was every single one. We killed him. He died for our sin. But listen, he died so we could have forgiveness and eternal life if we'd accept his mercy. How are you responding to Jesus? Some of you have up to this point in your life, you, you know the story of Jesus, you know the message around him, but perhaps you find in yourself today uh, an air of accusation, apathy, aggression, or is it acceptance? Listen, maybe you've made a commitment to faith in Christ, and yet there's still a level of apathy of, I could care less about the things of Christ. God is calling us today to respond to him. He leaves us no room for any other recourse. So as we close this time again together today, 
I want to just ask you how you're responding to the king. And I want to remind you again of just the simplicity and yet the directedness of the gospel. It's just this, remember? The, the bad news we must understand is that we have sinned against God and our sin cuts us off. We can't have any part with God or His Son Jesus because of our sin. The, the news gets worse. And that is that we can't do anything about it. Just like the people surrounding Jesus that day, we are guilty. And our guilt keeps us from being able to undo the wrongs that have been done. Uh, there's only one accusation for us that is right. That is that we are guilty. There's nothing we can do about it. Unable to save ourselves. Just like Barabbas. And yet, the good news is that God sent His Son, Jesus, who became a sin sacrifice for us on the cross. Three days later, he rose again from the dead. As a result of that, we can be saved and forgiven. And here's the best news. We can have it right now. We can have it through faith. Why? Because it's a free gift. Just like Barabbas in a prison cell. You don't have to do anything for it other than accept the offer. Repent of your sin and turn to faith in Christ. That's the gospel. And if that's something that you've done anything but accept then it doesn't matter how long we sit in a church building or how many times we attend, only the mercy of God can save us. Will you pray with me right now as I lead us? Lord, I come to you today and God, I pray right now first for your people. We're gathered together in a time of worship. Thank you for the encouragement of your word. And Lord, I, I pray that we understand, O oh Lord, as your word is being presented to us, that we are left no option of not responding. Lord, how will we respond to you? Then is true even now that you leave us no other recourse. Lord, I pray that your people who have come to you through faith, God would, by our lives, every single day, continue to say yes to you, Jesus. It's, it's not as though we... We gave our life to you, and then we go on about our merry way. Lord, every day we respond to you through faith. We trust you anew, and we surrender our lives. Oh, God, will you help your people to do so? And Lord, I, I pray, God, for those here or listening to me this morning who have never responded to you, Jesus. Or they've made different decisions, but not a decision to trust you and your mercy. I pray through the gospel they would come to you today. Lord, because you are worthy of it, because we need to give it to you, that we would offer up our very lives every single day, even today, in faith to you. Lord, only you can draw people to yourself, so will you do so even now? As we respond in faith, Jesus, we ask it all in your name. Amen.